After a couple weeks of turmoil in the markets, stock prices started to rise again as many anticipated an economic recovery. As we've noted, these sorts of panics and recessions were not uncommon. They had typically lasted an average of 15 months, and now with the Federal Reserve System in place, many expected them to be less severe. The stock market crash followed what was truly the beginning of the recession, marked by the decline in economic activity starting in the summer of 1929. By the fall of 1930, it had been 15 months, and things seemed as if they might be back to normal. But a new crisis was brewing across the nation's banking system. The Federal Reserve had been established to prevent banking panics from spreading by keeping banks solvent during a crisis. Banks in the Federal Reserve System keep their reserves with the Fed and have access to the Fed's discount window, allowing them to borrow the cash they need to keep their doors open in the event of a bank run. But most banks at the time were not part of the Federal Reserve System, at least not directly. About 16,000 of the nation's 24,000 banks were not part of the Federal Reserve System. Most were small country banks, which kept most of their reserves with a correspondent bank that served many of these smaller banks in a sort of smaller scale version of the Fed. Most of these correspondent banks were part of the Federal Reserve System, but some were not. One such outlier was Caldwell & Company, which was a large and growing financial holding company in the South. Caldwell invested heavily in the stock market, taking deposits from their many subsidiary banks and using them to buy stocks. When the market crashed, their financial position grew increasingly precarious. They limped on for many months afterwards because one of their subsidiaries, the Bank of Tennessee, provided banking services to the state and continued to receive deposits. But by November of 1930, they no longer had the cash they needed to stay afloat, and their failure set off a wave of failures among the correspondents that kept their reserves with them. Panic spread from town to town, and bank runs ensued. By December, there was considerable stress on banks nationwide as worried depositors withdrew their cash. Remember, at this time, if the bank you kept your money at went under, you lost everything. Many just didn't want to take that risk. Eventually, that pressure fell on a New York bank called the Bank of the United States. It was a private bank, but was part of the Federal Reserve System. The Bank of the United States reached out to the Fed in dire need of a loan to save itself from a run. But other bankers disliked the bank for its success for two reasons. First was the name. Immigrants and even citizens mistook the bank for the official government bank or central bank, even though it was private. Second was the ownership. It was Jewish and anti-Semitism robbed people of their reason. At the Fed, they used excuses about not wanting to bail out a failed enterprise to keep them from doing the job they were designed to do. And instead of saving the Bank of the United States, they let it fail with over $200 million in deposits, money that was now lost to those depositors. This event, like the collapse of Caldwell, generated newspaper headlines throughout the United States, stoking fears of financial panics and currency shortages like the Panic of 1907 and, and inducing jittery depositors to withdraw funds from banks everywhere. With money being withdrawn and credit markets freezing up, the money supply was falling and with it went prices. The price level fell by 2.7% in 1930, but fell by another 8.9% in 1931. Falling prices reduce consumption by incentivizing customers to wait until prices fall even more before making a purchase. Deflation also reduces the value of assets like homes and commercial real estate. The result is that even more loans made by banks go bust because they were made under the expectation of higher prices making it possible to pay them back. 
with more investments going bad, depositors had even more reason to worry about the money in their savings accounts. And when these banks fail, it's hard to get lending started again because the knowledge of who had good and bad credit disappears with those banks. In September of 1931, Britain announced it was leaving the gold standard. Speculators had observed that Britain did not have enough gold to cover the money they had printed and could not meet the obligations of their gold standard. They quickly pounced, exchanging the pound for gold, forcing Britain to abandon the monetary regime. Many Americans concluded that Britain's move meant that the U.S. would also abandon the gold standard, so they rushed to withdraw their deposits in the form of gold coins if possible, which worsened the growing problem of currency hoarding. Foreign investors also cashed out, leading to a huge outflow of gold from U.S. banks and the Federal Reserve to foreign destinations. In the midst of an unprecedented banking crisis, the Fed was forced to raise interest rates in order to attract gold back into their vaults to maintain the legal gold standard, and the higher rates pushed more borrowers into default and more banks into distress. In the following month, there were 522 bank failures. The economic picture over this time grew increasingly dire. What was a typical recession in 1930 turned into a depression in 1931, when GDP fell another 16.1%, and unemployment skyrocketed to 15.8%. But the banking crises had led to thousands of bank failures. Nine million savings accounts were wiped out. Without access to credit, industrial production fell by nearly half. Home building came to almost a complete standstill. Over a million families lost their farm. And by 1932, a quarter of the labor force was unemployed. Since this was a time in which most families had only one breadwinner, it meant that nearly a quarter of all Americans were left without an income. Millions became homeless. Children left their parents to spare them the difficulties of feeding them and set off to other parts of the country looking for work and a chance to support themselves. But these statistics bury the destitution that was faced by so many millions of people who suddenly struggled to get enough food, let alone shelter and clothing. And this economic hardship fell disproportionately on women and African Americans who often were fired from their jobs to make room for a white man. And while Americans had turned down the economic intervention offered by William Jennings Bryan a few decades before, amidst the Long Depression, many were starting to turn to their government for help when all other hope was lost. The Hoover administration had been reluctant to intervene in the economy, but as the depths of the depression became evident, they were spurred into action. Congress acted in 1932, funding a new government-sponsored corporation called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and Hoover tapped the most vocal dissenter of the discombobulated Federal Reserve to run it. Where the Fed was reluctant to intervene in what it saw as a market correction to the excesses of the 1920s, the RFC would now step in, funded with $2 billion by Congress, and make the emergency loans to banks in trouble. The new law also reformed some restrictions on the Federal Reserve, and the pressure from Congress and Hoover pushed them into using open market operations to purchase millions of dollars worth of government securities. Both of these measures had immediate and positive effects on the economy, but they didn't last long. The Fed abandoned its open market operations by the summer of 1932, far too early, and the RFC was required by law to publish the names of the banks it had made emergency loans to. In doing so, they inadvertently alerted the public to the precarious state of those banks, which ended up creating rather than preventing bank runs. As the summer waned in 1932, 43,000 demonstrators descended on Washington, D.C. They were all veterans of the First World War, 
For their service, veterans of the war were given certificates which promised them a cash payment with all interest accrued since 1924, which could be redeemed in 1945. Many of the veterans had already taken out loans against the value of their war bonus, and they were asking Congress to allow them to redeem their certificates early. Many of them were destitute with nowhere else to go, and so they camped in D.C. for weeks until Hoover ordered the military to remove them, which they did so violently and with the aid of six tanks. Perhaps the most popular man in America at the time was Father Charles Coughlin, whose weekly radio broadcast reached the entire nation. If the government can pay $2 billion to the bankers and the railroads, he said, why cannot it pay $2 billion to the soldiers? In November, when Hoover was up for re-election, voters decided it was time to give someone else a shot. Franklin Delano Roosevelt won the 1932 election by one of the biggest margins in U.S. history. He had followed in the political footsteps of his distant cousin, Theodore Roosevelt. Just like him, he had been elected to the New York State Legislature, became the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and was elected the Governor of New York. And while Teddy campaigned on a promise to give every American a square deal, Franklin promised Americans a new deal. And he got to work immediately after his March 4th inauguration by declaring a four-day banking holiday, which closed every single bank in America, including the Federal Reserve. For those four days, every American was locked out of their bank accounts. At the end of those four days, he signed into law sweeping reforms on banking and gave the first of his famous fireside chats, where he calmly attempted to restore people's faith in the financial system. Banks were slowly reopened once they were determined to be sound, and slowly but surely, customers returned their stockpiled cash to their savings accounts. By March 15th, the Dow Jones Industrial Average went up 15.34%, to this day, the largest one-day percentage gain in the history of the index. All that was left was to keep the banks sound and get the American economy running again.